Okay, um, right, well, I shall uh, kick off. Um, okay, first up, thank you so much for having me. It's um, really lovely to know that the research is actually making it uh, outside of my own little field um, and out to you guys. And you guys got a really interesting and fantastic beekeeping program. So that's uh, very um, pleasantly surprised to be invited. So thank you again. Um, so basically, um, who am I and what am I doing? Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Queensland University of Technology, um, and I'm actually an industrial designer, uh, a, a former electronic technician, an ex-rock and roll lighting technician, um, and a, a beekeeper of only about uh, seven or eight years now. Um, now, I'm in the final stages of my PhD, and I hope to actually send it out for external submission uh, in about a month, um, at which point... Um, I'm moving straight into a post-doctorate uh, role in uh, more bee research. So we're conducting really kind of transdisciplinary research, which is um, the way I like to think about it is there's an awful lot of uh, beekeeping and the art of beekeeping. Um, and there's an awful lot of science into how bees work, but there's not a huge crossover between beekeeping and science. Um, and there could be a lot more, but what we tend to find is that it's lots of small stuff about uh, disease, about pests, um, but there doesn't seem to be much on the practice of beekeeping and how we actually do beekeeping. So that's what I'm kind of uh, addressing with my research. Um, also, I manage the uh, QUT research apiary. Uh, when COVID hit, um, basically I was unable to travel to other beekeepers um, apiaries to do my experiments. So we uh, uh, basically raised a bit of money and I started a uh, 42 strong hive research apiary, which is now uh, somewhere in the region of about 50, well, 52 hives. Um, but we're looking to actually build up to uh, 100, 100 or so hives in the next uh, month and a half. Um, the reason we're doing this is because uh, when we're doing the, the experiments, you need a number that, uh, of hives to experiment on that takes away the possibility of chance and gives you statistically significant results. Um, but uh, it's also amazing because I've worked quite a long time just to be left alone in a field um, with the bees. So I'm pretty happy about that. So this research is part of a uh, Hort Innovation Australia project, um, which is called the development of non-destructive methods and systems for the assessment of hive health and around that we're looking uh, over the course of four years about how we assess uh, bee colony strength, how we do audits, how um, we can use sensing technology uh, to actually detect colony strength and we're also looking at things like uh, temperature and humidity and sound and weight and forage account to uh, basically work out if we can use these things to determine how strong hives are because your classic methods like the frame by frame or the cluster counts are a little bit destructive um, and invasive. So we're looking at if we can come up with better ways of doing this. Um, okay, so um, if you uh, are looking for some bedtime reading because you're having trouble getting to sleep, this is the paper that um, it came from, um, which is thermal impacts of apicultural practice and products on the honeybee colony. So we're basically looking at uh, robbing, uh, honey removal, uh, supering, and uh, we're looking at the impacts of the actual Langstroth hive itself. So, um, so in the course of this research, we've been saying, well, how does migratory apiculture impact bee colonies? And uh, as I mentioned earlier um, about the science, just looking at the small things, what I've been trying to do is look at it all the way from uh, essentially a truck and field scale, um, talking to growers, and orchardists uh, and large scale brokers, all the way down to the individual B scale. And we really wanna know what the problems and processes within migratory apiculture um, are and see if we can generate a measure of relief for these things. So uh, overall, my, um, my doctorate and this project covers uh, these five main areas. Um, and today, what we're going to be looking at is uh, the hive design and the practice, and particularly how temperature uh, affects this. Now, colony temperature, uh, as you likely know, and I had a look at the, the weather over there, um, and you're a little bit on the, the cooler side, um, especially compared to uh, Queensland and Australia. 
Um, so I thought I'd explain why colony temperature really mattered. Um, and basically it's because uh, the, the brood stages, um, a slight chilling by between, uh, I think it's about one to one and a half degrees can actually cause uh, some cognitive decline and retardation in the bees. Um, and it's, it especially affects their learning and their memory skills. Um, and what this means in the bigger picture is that bees don't come home. You either get a large amount of drift um, into other hives or you don't get any return at all because the bees have trouble actually memorizing uh, the broader picture, will go too far and just not return. And this causes uh, basically one reduced forager availability from the missing bees, but um, it also causes uh, a measure of um, stress in that the bees need to manage the temperature in the hive. And if they're managing the temperature, then they're not out foraging. So you're getting less nectar and less pollination coming in. Now, I mentioned um, more stress, and I'm just going to define what stress is. So um, stress basically occurs when animals have to make prolonged uh, physiological and behavioral adjustments in order to cope with their environment. So behavioral adjustments such as heating. So um, how do bees heat the hive? So an individual bee of um, in the kind of forager age uh, between, uh, well, sorry, before foraging all the way through to foraging um, between three and 27 days, each bee can generate up to about 43 degrees uh, centigrade. Um, and sorry, I can't quite work out on the fly what that is in Fahrenheit. Um, but they basically do this by heating, uh, heating up their thoraxes uh, using their antagonistic wing muscle pairs. Um, and it's basically one of those uh, uh, pre-flight preparation actions that they do before they reach the forager stage, uh, along with like kind of the fanning and the air conditioning and the defense is that building up getting ready to forage. But the interesting thing about the heating activity is that uh, unlike most activities in the hive, the bees can always jump back into uh, this thermal role. Whereas uh, things like uh, cleaning and nursing and feeding, they tend to leave alone once they've moved on. So there's two main methods of heating uh, the capped brood. Um, the first one is the thorax pressing, and this is basically where the bees will heat themselves up and they'll do a little bee push up on the, uh, the surface of the cells. And that transmits the temperature that, that they've raised themselves to and the heat through um, into the actual uh, comb uh, via contact and conduction. So that's the first method. Um, the second method is a more recent discovery, um, and that's the in-cell heating. Now, for a long time, it was thought that uh, if you had uh, gaps in your, uh, your brood, um, that that was basically a sign of a poor queen. And it is the so sign of a, a declining queen in some cases, um, or possibly disease. However, normally there should be around 5 to 10% of cells left empty uh, within the brood nest. And what the bees actually do is they will move into these cells and then they will heat themselves up. Um, and you can see the heating activity by, uh, you can watch uh, their abdomens pumping in and out as they start uh, respirating quicker. And this was previously thought to be either a cleaning activity or a resting activity until someone threw a thermal camera on them and discovered that what they were doing inside the cell was actually heating up and uh, transmitting the temperature to all the cells around them, which is very efficient, but also all the cells on the other side of the, uh, the foundation or the opposite side of the comb. Now, um, this is much more efficient than the thorax pressing and tends to be done, um, basically you'll find in the cooler climates, there's more spaces left for this activity. Now the bees can do this for up to about a 30 minute duration, um, at which point they need to go uh, have a bit of food and take a rest. So heat generation takes a lot of energy. Um, I'm going to throw some numbers um, around. I've done a little bit of conversion into uh, empirical. Um, hopefully I've got it right um, because we're, we're on the metric system over here. So I had to think about this. Um, now, do you guys use uh, joules and kilojoules as standards? Or mainly calories? Yeah, Maybe. both. I don't okay, think, fantastic. I don't um, think your audience is, is really thinking about that in terms of units very much. 
Okay, excellent, because um, I'll get onto that in a second. But let me throw some maths at you and I'll try and make it as painless as possible. So um, to heat up uh, their bodies to about 40 degrees uh, Celsius, um, it takes about 3.9 joules uh, per minute. Now, to give you an idea of how much energy that is, um, a milligram of honey contains about 12 joules and 12 joules of energy is enough energy to lift a one pound weight up to seven feet in the air. So if you picked up a one pound weight from the ground and you held it above your head, that weight would now have uh, about 12 joules of energy. Um, to put this into context, in terms of food numbers, a gram of honey is about 12 kilojoules, which is about three food calories, which is the capital C on the calories or kilocalories. And the adult human needs around uh, 2,000, 2,200 kilocalories per day uh, when they're not being uh, too energetic. Now, the final thing I'll do to convert this is um, a watt, as in your standard uh, power unit, is basically one joule a second. So um, basically a bee uh, will be using um, uh, less than a watt a second in heating activity. And to give you an idea that maintaining a brood nest temperature uses about the same amount of energy as running a 20 watt light bulb. So that's about 20 joules a second just at the center of the brood nest. Now, you're kind of wondering at this point why I'm telling, uh, telling you all this, um, but I'll put it into context um, because I wanted to know what happens when we put a cool super onto a, uh, a beehive. Um, so we did a, a whole bunch of experiments. And what we found is was that, uh, some of these are fairly obvious, is that the heat will actually rise from the brood nest, uh, which essentially drains some of the heat out of it. And it starts heating up the frames, the comb and uh, the foundation. Now the colony underneath has a heat deficit because there's something else it's trying to heat. And you've changed that internal environment massively. Um, we can kind of liken it to uh, being at home on a nice uh, cool day and someone removes the roof of your house and then all the warm air zips up into the, the sky above you. Um, so what this means is that the bee colony then needs to start doing uh, increased heating activity to maintain that core temperature at 35 degrees Celsius um, and uh, basically keep the hive at the optimal temperature so we don't get problems with uh, brood retardation. So what I wanted to do is actually um, calculate how uh, this works. So um, I made some theoretical uh, mathematical models um, of the temperature. And because this graph is a little bit teeny tiny, I'll throw some big arrows. Um, we found that both uh, virgin wax and plastic foundation uh, both take about 150 kilojoules. Um, which is around 30, 40 calories um, to heat up from about a 15 degrees Celsius uh, environment. So, um, and that's basically taking that box up to uh, that ideal temperature. Now, if we look at the line above it, the blue one, what we find is that uh, putting on extracted honeycomb is more than double that quantity, at around 315 kilojoules to heat up that super above them. And then if the beehive uh, or your colony is unlucky enough that you're going to throw an entire box of um, honey on it, say from either a, a dead out or that you just want to know how much energy is in a, in a full super, then it's around a whopping 1.3 megajoules of energy, um, which is almost 10 times as much. Um, now, I, I say that this never actually happens of putting a full box of cool honey on top of a uh, beehive. But unfortunately, I have seen it when people have had problems with beehives or underperforming beehives when they start joining colonies and doing things like this. And the actual heat impact is, is huge when you're supering. Um, if you're under supering, it's a lot, lot less. OK, so one of the questions that might be popping into your minds at this point is that um, given the difference between foundation and uh, extracted comb, should you always be using foundation rather than the extracted comb? And the answer to that is basically a resounding no, um, because the amount of energy required by the beehive, beehive to build out that fresh comb on wax foundation 
is around 382 megajoules of energy. And that's 283 times more than the energy to actually heat up your, your stickies or your extracted comb. Now, again, because this number isn't very useful, let me convert it into something more useful. Um, and that number is about 65 large domino meat lovers pizzas um, of energy. So next time someone says, oh, you should always use foundation rather than this, just, just refer them back to the 65 pizzas and that's per super to generate out that uh, about four or five kilos of wax you get in the 10 frame Langstroth. Now, when I was thinking about this um, and trying to make these numbers more useful, what I thought was that kilojoules and megajoules um, and watts is not a real world uh, number for most people. Um, so I was trying to put it into something more useful. So we converted, uh, well, we created a new unit um, to talk about this and it's B minutes. So uh, what we're talking about is how much heating work does it take a B to do to warm up? Um, so for example here, what we've got is, um, you'll see that heating up a uh, foundation, either wax or plastic, there's virtually no difference, um, from 15 degrees uh, centigrade up to 35, uh, sorry, up to 35 degrees centigrade, takes around 35,000 B minutes. So that's 35 minutes for 1,000 Bs or 1,000 minutes for 35 Bs. So it's a considerable amount of energy. And then throwing on a, a super that has got stickies or extracted comb on it um, is more than double that at about 80,000 B minutes of activity. Now, personally, I find these a much more useful metric because we can then start thinking about how much energy the colony is actually putting into uh, the work they're doing. Um, so I decided to put this into some kind of real world metrics. And uh, in the case of Brisbane, um, I plotted the, the monthly mean highs and the monthly mean lows of uh, where I live in Brisbane. And I worked out how much energy it took. Um, so the orange bars are obviously the highs and the blue bars the lows. And the orange line is the amount of energy it requires to heat up a super at the high temperature. And the blue line is how much energy it takes to heat up a super at the monthly mean cools. And you can see that there's considerable difference in the amount of energy that's required to heat up a super between a cool day and a warm day. Um, in fact, it's about three times more energy is required. Now I was looking at this and I was thinking, hold on, I'm in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, all of my stuff is backwards to where you guys are. So I replotted it for uh, where you guys are at in California. And this is what it looks like. It's not quite as drastic as over here, but this is your uh, monthly uh, high and low uh, temperatures. And this is the difference in the energies um, that the bee colony will spend to heat up a 10 frame super, uh, full depth super. Um, between those warm and those cool days. And it's about two times more uh, on your, your nicest days, um, sorry, your warmest days. Um, so that works out about 30,000 extra B minutes. Now, one of the things that uh, I like about this research is that once we identify a problem like this, um, we can start offering solutions. Um, and in this case, uh, the solutions that we've offered, it could range from everything from uh, preheating your supers beforehand with space heaters, or my favorite solution, which is uh, in Australia, we use a, a silver tarp to reflect the sunlight, but the back of it has a black side. So all we actually have to do is stop using the silver side of the tarp, flip it over and use the black side. And on the back of a truck, that'll actually heat all the supers up um, and reduce the energy output by the colony uh, vastly. And that means that when you super up your colonies, your bees are actually getting this 30 to, in some cases, 90,000 extra minutes of um, foraging time to go out and get honey and, and pollen, which means they're basically doing a better job. So by looking at that, we kind of defined how the supering activity um, impacts the bee colony. The next thing I want to look at, whoops, was uh, what role honey actually plays within the hive. Um, because I figured that we're, we're taking off honey on a regular basis and it's, it, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mass there. So I asked two questions, which was, uh, does honey help stabilize hive temperature? 
and does uh, robbing the honey um, impact the bee colony? So what I did was I set up um, an experiment with uh, two sets of boxes, uh, two supers with, um, with bases and lids, um, no bees, because this was just testing how honey impacts it. We are gonna do field tests with live bees just to check this. Um, but what we found was that the, in an experiment, we took a temperature controlled cabinet, which is essentially like a, a big oven crossed with a big fridge that you can set uh, different temperatures and times on. And we set up an experiment where we had 12 hours at the ideal brood temperature of 35 degrees or a uh, nice late spring, early summer day uh, where we are. And then we had 12 hours at 15 degrees, which is kind of those evening temperatures around the same period. And if you look at the blue dashed line, that's the temperature of the, the environment. That's the temperature of the oven. And then if you look at the yellow line, you'll see that that is the temperature of the extracted honeycomb. And that's the comb closely following the, um, the ambient temperature. So you can see there's a little bit of a delay in the, the cooling and the heating of it, but it's not a huge amount. So that's basically what your hive experience is when you put on a super of extracted um, comb. And then the green line in the center is the bit I got really excited about because that is the center temperature of a super full of honey. And you can see that actually that barely changes by more than about six degrees um, over the course of 24 hours. Um, and that's uh, basically about 4% the rate of change of the environment. So what's happening there is that the honey is acting like a storage battery for the heat. It's soaking up excess heat, so the bees don't need to do so much cooling activity within the hive. And then it's re-radiating that stored thermal energy back into the hive as the day cools. So the bees don't have to do as much um, heating work in the hive. So jumping back to those two questions. Oh, there you go, forgot about those. Um, jumping back to those questions, what we found was that in terms of does honey help stabilize hive temperature, the answer is a resounding yes, it does. Um, and what we found is that it acts as a source of thermal mass within the hive and that the temperature rate of change is just 4% of the ambient temperature. And that's, that's really good because it basically means that uh, the bee colony has to do a huge amount less work to maintain a stable environment inside the hive. Um, and we basically call this a measure of thermal hysteresis. Um, and the hysteresis is basically it's resistance to change over time. Now, one of our other more recent experiments, um, actually, sorry, before I jump to that, to answering the other question, we asked, does robbing honey impact the hive? Um, and the answer to that is it's very likely, yes. Um, because the more temperature variations means more heating activity, more fanning, um, and then you don't have so many forages because they're all basically trying to maintain hive temperature. One of the really interesting things we found recently um, in some of our ongoing experiments is that not only does this, um, this resistance to change uh, show through in the honey and help the bee colony, but it actually provides us with a fairly new and interesting way of measuring what the honey stores in, in the beehive are without using any hive scales. Because if the hive takes longer to heat up or longer to cool down than the environment, we can actually calculate how long it takes to reach its peak temperature, right? And that's duration, which we worked out as being just under 1400 seconds, um, is an indicator of how much, um, how strong a colony is in terms of population, but also how uh, many stores they have in terms of that. So currently we're working on a, a brand new um, method of sensing colony strength and stores just using temperature sensors, which means that you'd have a lot less wires and a lot less technology uh, to be able to actively monitor um, the kind of the weight and how much honey you've got. Uh, now that's breaking research. It's not yet published. So you've got a bit of a preview in here. So uh, don't go telling too many people quite yet. Um, okay, so moving on to the next part of the research, we wanted to know what uh, the Langstroth hive and was like and how it impacted 
uh, the actual bee colony. Now, I started off as an industrial designer. Um, basically, industrial design is where uh, we are product designers. But um, putting it into context, we like to say that um, architects design buildings, um, fashion designers do the fashion bits, and industrial designers do everything else. So industrial designers uh, design cars down to ballpoint pens. They design electronics. And we spend a lot of time looking at how people use things. And one of the big questions that actually got me onto my uh, PhD journey was, why are we still using a 160-year-old um, honey production system? And why hasn't it changed? Now, as an example, I'm going to point to uh, this gentleman sat here uh, with his uh, Hoffman frame and his uh, bit of wax foundation. And this was taken in the uh, late 1800s, uh, probably about uh, 15, 20 years after he'd invented the uh, Langstroth hive in uh, 1854. Um, and once he invented this, uh, everyone jumped on the bandwagon. We had Hoffman, who invented the self-spacing frames in the oh, 1870s, off the top of my head. Uh, we had um, uh, the, another guy who basically invented the foundation press. We had someone who invented the smoker. And all this stuff happened in a period of about 30 years uh, from 1854 onwards. Um, and I mean, it wasn't until I think uh, just before 1900 that the centrifugal extractor was invented. Um, so there was a lot of innovation and then it pretty much just stopped. Now, to give you an idea of the level of innovation in other industries, if we jump to the dairy industry, um, this is a picture from um, dairy industry in Vermont uh, in uh, 1870. And you can see that the height of the technology in the dairy industry was um, a stool and a metal bucket and a small boy to carry things uh, when you needed fresh buckets. Um, now, jumping ahead to today, if we look at the dairy industry, we basically see uh, an automated um, set, set of systems. In this case, um, this is just a couple of years ago, these cows are all wearing RFID tags. Um, they walk in to get fed. As they walk in to get fed, uh, they are tagged. It's measured how much food they eat. The amount of milk they uh, get plumbed into and produce is uh, analyzed, including the fat content. And it's checked for things like antibodies and uh, diseases. And then um, the entire system from basically pasture all the way to that bottle of milk that appears on the supermarket shelf is tracked. However, beekeeping is still just a guy with a, a box and a bunch of wax frames in it. Now, when I say this to beekeepers, I get a lot of um, quite energetic reaction. And I always, they always say, well, if it bro ain't broke, don't fix it. And what I like to point to at this point is um, Henry Ford, who said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Because he looked at a problem and everyone said, we just need faster, stronger horses. But what he came up with was the motor car. And uh, invariably, he then went on to be the first person to do mass manufacturing. And this was the entire rise of the, um, the automotive uh, industry and the gasoline industries um, and whatever your thoughts about those are. But basically, where I'm trying to point out to here is that this is uh, a bit of innovative thinking that helped launch uh, an entirely new industry um, by saying, well, let's not look how to fix the system we have, but what can we do to improve the system? Now, I'm not here to try and redesign the beehive. There's enough people trying to redesign it all the time. Um, what my aim is, is to basically quantify the impacts of the beehive on our bee colony and look how we can improve beehives for both the beekeeper and the bees inside um, by publishing the result of this so people can look at it and then start doing product development so i'm not in this for the for the profit i'm in this to try and push an industry forward by providing more information so jumping back to the langstroth the questions i was asking uh were as about the thermal properties of the langstroth um, and specifically i want to know how does the hive contribute to heat loss so what I did was I created, uh, again, some kind of mathematical models of um, what a hive is made for. 
And I put uh, uh, basically an imaginary set of mathematical bees inside that would heat up the box to about 35 degrees Celsius or the good brew temperature. And then I compared this to the external ambient temperatures that we'd, we'd find around. And what this model uh, showed was that um, these green lines uh, are basically a wooden hive. So this top one is a, uh, uh, a Langstroth wooden hive using the standard uh, measurement widths and the standard lids. And we find it loses about 95 watts of um, energy uh, when it's at 15 degrees external environment. Now this is huge. Um, I mean, this essentially it's like uh, leaving a 100 watt light bulb burning all the time. Um, and any any mums and dads out there will know that shouting, you shout at your kids all the time about leaving their lights on because that energy actually costs a lot. Um, now to put this in context, if we jump to uh, another material such as expanded polystyrene, we see that expanded polystyrene uh, hives actually use just a quarter of the energy or lose a quarter of the energy. Now, I chose the expanded polystyrene because it's actually one of our best insulating materials that we have commercially available, um, not because it's something that's currently in uh, manufacture for various hives, but it's a great way to illustrate that you can actually quarter your energy losses uh, and the energy output by your colony just by changing the material of the hive. And really interesting is that these two little lines down here, which is on your standard wooden hive again, which is your uh, pine walls and your, um, uh, your lid, which in Australia is classically made of 10 or 12 mil uh, masonite, which is like a compressed particle board. Um, and what we see is that the walls and the lid lose almost the same amount of energy. So the lid loses as much energy as all of the rest of the hive. Um, and that's actually quite interesting because when I'm asked what I would approve on the Langstroth, I say just one thing and do it right now. And it costs you uh, less than a dollar a hive um, is to actually go out and insulate your lids. And you can go buy foam board and tuck it on the outside. You can buy expanding foam. Uh, you can use uh, rock wool or um, any kind of insulation from your, your Home Depot type stores. Um, and it's a super easy thing to do to immediately halve the amount of heat energy lost by your bee colony. Um, because if you've got better insulating lids, you basically have less energy loss. And that means there's less colony stress. And you end up with healthier bees who are actually able to go out and do more foraging. And they can do that foraging a little bit later and a little bit earlier in the year when normally they might be starting to think about clustering up. So. I'm kind of going to start wrapping up um, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions, which is how does all this apply to you? And I'm going to put this in the context of what I was talking about with Langstroth and uh, how the hive really hasn't changed for almost 160 years or 140 years. Um, is that as beekeepers, why do we do what we do? Like, why do you use the stuff you do? Why do you do your manipulations like you do? Is it because it's what you've always done? Is it because someone showed you how to do that and you just carried on doing it? And the big question is, is what small changes with this sort of information can you make to reduce the bees thermal stress? And therefore basically give yourself some happier bees that end up collecting more honey for you or being better pollinators. Okay, well, thank you. Um, any questions? Well, Daniel, I want to tell you that I, I, I thoroughly agree with your, your last point of, is, a, you know, a, a better lid. So I've been using um, a deep inner cover with insulation and an insulated cover. And I've been putting that on all of them because I was along the same thinking as you. But thank you very much for the science to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, interestingly, what I found out, um, because I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if you guys have the phrase, that you ask two beekeepers the same question, you get 10 different answers. Yeah, quite. Um, well, uh, I've, I've presented this uh, in New South Wales and I actually found out that because um, in Australia towards the, the center, the days get up to about 45 degrees Celsius and the nights get down to about minus five. 
um because it's kind of like devil so what they actually do is in summer they paint the lids white and in winter they paint them black again um then there's no insulation i was just like hey you know you can just go out and insulate that lid and you won't need to do that anymore but that insulation is such a such a saver for the bee colony We've been, um, I've, I've been uh, playing around with quilt boxes uh, mm -hmm. with my hives uh, over the last few years. I, I've, I've had some pretty good success with that. Um, and I've done things like, you know, drop a thermometer in there and just, you know, you can, there's, you know, perforations in the bottom of the quilt boxes and I can stick like a thermometer through there and just sort, sort of play around and see what the temperature is all about. And, mm -hmm. um, we don't get much of where I live in the part of the Bay Area where I live. My um, my maximum, my minimums are fairly constant through um, almost 12 months. My my average temperature in July is maybe about one or two degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> um, uh, warmer than it is in January here. And we mm -hmm. I, I get very little extreme um, in my part of the Bay Area. So. Um, and and so I've I've had very good success using quilt boxes. Um, in in addition, uh, because the, the Nate where, where I live is also considerably more humid, they, they tend to absorb a bit more humidity, which is kind of nice. I get like this nice. It, it is working for me. Um, mm -hmm. and I also have adapted um, most of my hives with a bottom box uh, filled with um, wood chips to act as as thermal insulation on the bottom of it as well. And and that seems to be. I don't know. They, I'm just playing around with different things just to sort of see if it's is, to see if what's going on. And I'm not. It seems to be. It's it's fun. It's fun to experiment. And I'm I'm sort of <laughs> with like the idea of like you know the you know the stack. I used to call it the big stack. Um, yep. it, just, it wasn't working for me. It wasn't working in a lot of ways. And it just it didn't seem right. I was losing hives, losing colonies, and. Um, so I've gone to like horizontal, horizontal type hives with making all kinds of adaptations to it, just you know, experimenting to see what happens. So I think it's it's great to experiment. I love your, I love having the data. That, that's wonderful that you've got the, you know, keeping track of stuff. It's really neat. I mean, it's, I mean, talking about what you were saying with the big tall stacks. Um, one of the interesting things is is that. Classically, what uh, people used to do is they would under super before the hives became quite so big, and the under supering stops that kind of uh, that ice box of, of honey, as someone described it to me, um, because the bees get to take advantage of that thermal thermal uh, gradient that goes throughout the hive. And in summer, they would go lower so that the top stays hot, and then as winter came, they'd move up, take advantage of that thermal gradient within the hive. And unfortunately, with the Langstroth hive, while he did make a great honey collection system, by putting a supering system on and then putting a queen excluder in, all of a sudden the bees can't take advantage of that thermal gradient. Right. So you basically spend an awful lot of energy not being able to move up to take advantage of that, and therefore you expend more energy, which is more stress on the hive. So one of the classic um, areas of uh, contention or um, things that are mentioned in the bee books is uh, water collection on the uh, underside of the cover and water mm -hmm. dripping down on the bees. And yep. um, I found that putting um, three or four centimeters of styrofoam insulation above a solid uh, board, a piece of plywood, uh, about yep. 17 millimeters thick or so, three quarter inch. Um, put put styrofoam on top of that, and then put something to shed the water on top of that. And mm -hmm. the bees, I think, are happier because there's not the water collection on the top. Plus, there's less mildew growth on the underside of the top cover uh, because the top of the lid is warm. And that that goes for winter uh, going into the season we're going into now. And of course, in the summer, when the sun is beating down on the top of the hive, that insulation keeps the top of the hive from getting overheated. So I've kind of been uh, suggesting this uh, strategy for a couple of years. And I'm, I'm glad to see you uh, reinforcing <laughs> that, that uh, concept. Well, it, it's funny because, I mean, there's there's an awful lot of um, beekeeper anecdotes about what works and what people have tried. And 
Um, in terms of an industry, there's this huge amount of innovation with people like yourselves uh, making modifications to their hives and finding stuff that works, but it's just not filtering over to either the mainstream apiculture in terms of commercial stuff, and it's not being looked at by the scientists with that kind of product thing. And it's certainly the, the humidity on the inside of the, the boxes is an interesting one because if you've got, if it's a warm, if you're in a warm room and you've got a window and you're, uh, it's cold outside, that's certainly going to generate condensation, which is why we use double and triple glazing to, to stop that and stop that thermal gradient. And just putting that little bit of insulation like you are on the, on the lids um, will stop you having that temperature change causing that condensation. And where we are, if you've got that condensation, then it attracts the uh, small hive beetle as well, and you have terrible problems. And just by insulating the lid, you can get around those problems so quickly. In some parts of the US, of course, they have winter where it snows and, and you have bees that are confined to the hive um, three, four, five, six months of the year. Yep. Um, and in those climates, they often wrap um, uh, maybe uh, um, some sort of impermeable uh, material around the hive to keep the mm -hmm. wind from uh, blowing through it and to provide some insulation. Uh, they, they put this uh, foam, or not foam, but bubble sort of insulation material around the hives to keep them warm. Uh, and in some uh, parts of Canada, they even move them into uh, enclosed spaces where they keep the temperature um, in the 40s, I think, in order to keep them yeah. confined in the hive. So um, the, I th perhaps what you have uh, for us is good for our climate, but maybe not uh, quite what needs to be propagated out to the even colder climates. Well, I mean, the interesting thing with, there is that um, look, these are European honeybees. And what's really interesting is we've taken something that's used to this beautiful Mediterranean environment that's not too cold or that's not too warm, but can survive in those cooler climates. And we've basically propagated them to pretty much every continent on the planet uh, with all these temperature ranges. Um, so, I mean, we haven't really looked at the clustering behavior, which is like a major uh, aside to this research because we look within a certain range of temperatures because as soon as you get down to that 12 degrees uh, Celsius, all of a sudden the behaviors in the, the, the hive change. And we're, we're still actually trying to work out what happens uh, once the bees stop heating and then move into cooling, which is what our experiments this year are, is how those two behaviors kind of dovetail together and how we can look at that. But I feel that there's so many um, bits of research that haven't quite made it out to uh, basically beekeepers in terms of these respects. I mean, we are trying to deal with it, but where we are, it doesn't really snow, so it's kind of hard to do this. So there's a Sorry. few more PhDs in the subject. Well, uh, <laughs> yes. Well, look, our, um, our current exper experiments are looking at um, mm -hmm. more temperature things. Um, we're looking at that cooling to heating behaviors. Um, one of the things my pet project is investigating bearding mm -hmm. behaviors, which has received almost no scientific um, uh, attention. Um, but we will be getting there. It's just, it's a slow process to do it properly, but it's, um, yeah, it's getting there. And it's all about working with beekeepers to get the best outcomes, really. What do you have to suggest for the top bar beekeeper? Yeah, the top bar beekeepers, um, I think in the traditional horizontal hives that used to get stuffed with straw um, to act as that kind of insulation blanket. So um, yeah, any insulation, and the insulation is so good today with uh, things like the, the rock wool and the glass fiber and the earth wool, I don't know if you get there, which is like the recycled bottles. <coughs> yeah, as much insulation as possible. Um, you no, know, I'd, I'd like to, to join well, here. I have um, a question on the, um, can you clarify on your uh, graph last one where there was a, a temperature loss between a wall and a lead? Now, is that lead just a migratory lead or is it a, like a typically we use, you know, I use inner cover and the top cover. So is mm -hmm. it, which one are you, uh, is that the study of? 
Uh, so this was of a uh, migratory lid, uh, being the, the, the thicker lids uh, that some that have the vents drilled in either end. Uh, and then it has a 12mm uh, uh, piece of either WeatherTex or Masonite, which is like a compressed board. And then it has a galvanized roof on top of that, a galvanized sheet on top. Uh, we didn't use the inner covers because what we were doing was we were replicating normal, um, uh, basically normal beekeeping setup. So in Australia, we don't tend to use the inner covers as much. Um, what we tend to use is either a hive mat made of um, either linoleum or canvas, um, or we just don't have anything in there at all. So quite often you'll see that uh, there's no inner cover, which is why we did the calculations like that to kind of define it. So with an inner cover, uh, like you run, you'll find that you have less uh, losses, but you can get even less than that if you have some sort of insulation in that top area too. Okay, so then, um, uh, I, you know, kind of interesting in you know, living in the Bay Area before I studied, you know, when I studied beekeeping, a lot of books were uh, the written, like a lot of winter preparations and so forth. So first year, I was really freaking out, like a winter is coming and what am I doing here? So and, and I've been buying the honey frame and adding into the box because I thought they were really hungry, but it turned out to be uh, now, the uh, November, December, there's a cluster down and then they continue to grow in January, February. And then usually first or harvest is like end of March and then beginning of April. But mm -hmm. only one thing that I have observation was that the, uh, the bigger the colony, the water condensation was at the highest. And then yep. they were just dripping down like crazy. So uh, what I've done is an inner cover notched out upper lip about three inches and then um, cover with the, uh, uh, those are the window um, netting. And then, mm -hmm. uh, so leave it on. And then I did all 50 hives to see what they do. And mm -hmm. uh, the reduction of the, uh, the condensation it uh, drastically, um, uh, reduced and then it's not really completely um, dried mm -hmm. but only one I, my theory was that the, uh, if they do not like it they may propolize it they were controlled yep. entry, right and uh, out of 50 only one one colony was a shaded area and completely propolized it closed it up so I said okay so Seems like uh, that the size of the uh, exit point and upper lip and it worked. And then what I did was a uh, time to time, I flipped it over the entrance exit point to the down side and then moved to the other side and uh, left um, the uh, 180 degree and the four positions uh, upper left, right and the down left, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on how they, uh, the condensation moves around and it seems like a, it's not a, so what I'm saying is that as you said, you know, if you ask, a, you know, at the two, um, one uh, beekeeper, you get 10 different answers. Even the same experiment, you get four different, five different answers that it's not just one setting. Mm -hmm. It just, uh, so it, it was just uh, eye opening. And um, yeah. anyway, that was my point. Okay. What's, what's interesting about uh, what you're saying is that, um, yeah, every beekeeper sees something different because Essentially, every beekeeper has a different sub subspecies of bees. So you might, everyone might be running uh, like Italian bees or Carniolians or Caucasians, but because you've been breeding and the breeding cycle is quite rapid uh, for the genetics, um, what we see is that the bees adapt particularly to different areas. So, like uh, where you were saying about propolizing up the top vents. Um, we find that they, where we are, they'll always propolize the top fence. And I run solid bottom boards um, and I run a migratory lid, but they block those top vents. And we don't have the problems with condensation, even when it's at our most humid, because we have that extra insulation layer. But when you do have those top vents, what tends to happen is that the, the bottom of the hive will suck in the air and it will basically act as a chimney taking it out. So when you have a large population, they don't mind that because uh, when the foragers return, they're hot. 
right? So the returning foragers are actually contributing to that heat. So they have an excess of heat within the hive. So that kind of chimney effect is okay because they've got more heat than they know what to do with. Um, whereas a weaker colony that doesn't have so many returning foragers, uh, that kind of chimney effect will have a real problem because they're losing heat faster than they can replace it. So they're likely to propolize up um, those vents. And we find that most of our bees will propolize up those, those top vents um, because they do more fanning activity at the bottom. But there's so many variations based on where your bees came from and what environments they're used to and what's flowering. And we have beekeepers in Australia that um, will quantify hot and cold nectars. Um, and they say, oh, there's a, it's a very hot nectar, i.e. the bees, um, basically the hive stays nice and warm or a cold nectar, which will actually be not as good for the bees because it requires a lot more evaporation and energy and the bees tend to not do very well on that nectar supply. So, but you're absolutely right. There's so many variations of what people do because no two species of bees are quite the same. I think that kind of addresses your point in a roundabout way. I, I have a question, um, two questions actually. Just one came to mind as you were talking about hot nectar and cold nectar. I wonder what syrup, homemade syrup from sugar, would that be considered a hot or a cold nectar? Depends what ratios you're using. So, um, so your standard honey, uh, sorry, your standard nectar is between, uh, well, it's between about uh, 10 to about 20% um, sugar to water ratio. Um, when we're feeding here, um, depending what ratio of sugar to water you're using, uh, you use for different purposes. So when we do uh, feed weaker hives or nukes, um, coming into winter, uh, we'll use basically a one-to-one -one, um, sugar syrup, uh, so 50% sugar. And the reason is for that because when it's that thick, they'll store it. So I would consider that to be a, a, a hot nectar because uh, it doesn't require much evaporation um, because, you know, getting uh, making honey requires the bees to reduce the water content down to about 14 to 18%, depending on your type of honey. Um, but if we're trying to use a, a sugar syrup to stimulate um, the queen's laying, then we'll drop down to around about 30% um, uh, sugar to uh, water, uh, because we found that that will really move forward the, uh, the, queen, uh, the queen's laying and stimulate the colony because they'll use that as a food source rather than a storage source. Um, so I would have thought that would be on the more cool side. But this is this is a guess. This is something we haven't really looked into. This is just from talking to commercial apiarists and what they feed and uh, what they consider to be good and bad nectars. Um, and it also comes down to the quality of the nectar, I think, as well, in terms of how much energy there's actually in that nectar. And so my other question, thank you, was um, on this stuff called Reflectix, that they're selling at Home Depot. That's the silver, it's yeah, yeah. silver on both sides. And about your comment about leaving the honey supers on um, as, as a way for them to um, regulate the heat in their hive. So for me, <clears throat> if I have to pull a, a full honey super off the top of my tower, every time I'm gonna look at my bees, that's, that's hard on me right? Mm -hmm. To remove that and put it back on it. And it also, in a bee-dense area of North Oakland, it's almost a liability for robbing. Um, yep. And so I was, and I feel bad now <laughs> if I'm taking all the honey off. Um, I'm wondering, is the Reflectix a, um, a, a good substitute for all that honey? Can, can, you, can you do things to modify the fact that you're taking all the honey off um, the top and, and also using Reflectix to wrap the sides? And then I have another question. Can you overheat them too with too much insulation? Okay, so um, with the Reflectix, there's basically, um, there's four different thermal actions going on within the hive. Um, 
so you basically, uh, we everyone knows about convection, uh, where the heat rises and creates a convection current, um, where basically, and that's the hot air rising and moving around. And that's where your kind of condensation house because it's hitting a cool surface and the water comes out because you have what's called a dew point, the water condenses. The next one is um, basically uh, radiation. So um, a hot bee or the warm honeycomb will uh, basically transmit its heat um, through essentially infrared, infrared, infrared radiation, which is what your thermal cameras pick up. And so when the, the heat is being uh, shone onto the sides of the hive, that then basically hits the sides of the hives where it's absorbed. And then the sides uh, of the hive and the lid conduct the heat out, just like holding a, a metal rod in the fire, you feel it getting hot after a time and fairly quickly. The wood is actually uh, not a great conductor, but it's it's not uh, a bad one. Um, but that takes it out and then it radiates the heat again. So you have various stages. What the reflective insulation does is it bounces back that infrared radiation. So um, when you wrap a hive in, in your foil or uh, your reflectics, what would happen is the heat being lost by the sides of the hive would be bounced back into the side of the hives. Yeah, you're still going to be loss, having losses because of air convection and the heat moving through the air gaps. What you'd need is the way that the insulation works is the insulation prevents the uh, convection by creating lots of air gaps that are self-contained and it basically gives you more space, which basically prevents conduction of the heat. So as well as things like the, uh, the foil wrap, you would need to put on uh, your classic insulation to give you some of that kind of thickness around the hive to keep it warm. Um, so the short answer is it will work a little bit, but not as well as thick insulation, which would be my first port of call. Um, if you're trying to reduce the amount of heat absorbed from the sun, then that sort of reflective insulation um, is very good. Beekeepers in, in Queensland actually paint all their hives silver um, because it reflects more heat energy, um, so the bees don't cook inside. Now to your next point, um, with regard to taking off the honey, um, Taking off honey is, is fine, but it's that kind of thing where you've always got to leave just enough honey for the bees so they don't starve out. But what uh, my research has kind of pointed to is that not only does it provide a food store, but it provides that help in keeping the beehive warm and mediating that warm cool. However, too much honey that they can't effectively heat acts like an ice box and all the bees heat actually goes into warming that honey up just a little bit because it takes an awful lot of energy to heat up by that 1.5 megajoules of energy to heat up. So if you're not taking off the honey, you're basically detrimenting the colony because they need to try and heat this thing up. But they've got no chance of heating. However, a little bit of honey left on the sides, which can stay warm, acts like a kind of thermal barrier, more insulation within. So I think hopefully I've addressed what you were asking there, um, hopefully in a fairly not so roundabout manner. Um, and sorry, you had a final question, which was, please remind me. I, well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, somebody else fill in the blank. Um, Wasn't yeah, it about the, the reflectics? Well, yeah. So you kind of answered it in the- Yeah, I think so. I mean, what you find is there's, um, there is some of the uh, insulation that has a reflective side on the thick insulation, um, which basically reflects back the infrared energy, but it also offers um, that thickness that basically breaks down conduction and the convection, which are your two killers, basically, um, when it comes to beehives, is um, convection and conduction. I mean, this is why things like the, uh, I don't know if you have paradise hives over there, which are the thick polystyrene hives. Um, that's why those are great because they basically stop the heat leaving the hive in the first place um, and try and keep it all in, which means it takes less energy to keep everything up to temperature. Yeah, I was gonna ask you that about you know, styrene hives. There's a, a bunch of different ones out there. And yep. how, how do they fare? Are they reasonably good or? Look, um, that 
uh, that slide I had up, uh, which I will I'll just throw it back up again. Um, one second. Um, the polystyrene hives, um, they are better. Um, this is this EPS is the, the styrene, the expanded polystyrene. Um, because they uh, have a much higher insulating property, they um, basically, they keep in much more energy and lose just a quarter of the energy of your classic wood ones. Um, and look for, if you're not running a huge number of hives uh, and you're happy to wear the cost, that's good. They've had a reasonably low uptake within the commercial operators, basically because they're more expensive and they tend not to do so well with some of the rougher treatments that we see out on the road. But look, the expanded polystyrene stuff is great. Um, but one of the things you can do is, uh, can you see my mouse pointer on here? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So if these are the, if this is the kind of the lids here, the, sorry, the lid and the walls of the wood hives, just by swapping out uh, the lid there down to the, the expanded polystyrene down here, then you can make a real saving as that kind of part way uh, thing to go. I mean, it sounds like you guys are already starting to think about insulation um, anyway, but yeah, so the thicker the insulation, the better really. The other big one is, um, it's really about getting that thermal mass into the hive. Um, is that just like when you've got, uh, like when you have uh, either a cave or uh, those kind of concrete house, concrete houses and bunkers, they stay cool in the summer and warm in the winter because it's harder to change the temperature of something that has a lot of mass. Um, the downside is, is if you have a really high thermal mass, it means heavy. And not many beekeepers want a 150 kilo beehive um, because while it's great for temperature, it's not so good for moving around. So, you know, the uh, Layens hive, um, one of the, which is kind of really interesting to sort of see what they they do is um, they have like an inner gas uh, um, chamber. They have like an inner, they have an inner wall in the hive and an outer wall, and they stuff it with um, with wool. Yeah. So you get you get that what you were talking about you get that exactly you get like a it, it it takes a lot to heat it it takes a lot to cool it so you get this really stable temperature in in the interior the yep. trade off of course is that it takes five grown men to lift it and move it so <laughs> the carpenter's yeah. equivalent of a tree trunk yeah <laughs> yeah like 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 moving it moving an oak um, mm -hmm. that's a, yeah. But uh, yeah, but it's it's pretty interesting. So you know, I've been reading a lot about some of the stuff people use, um, and have been experimenting with, like uh, you know, from straw, you know, ram dearth, ram straw, wool, all kinds of interesting things to try and get that. You know, and they talk That's... about like, um, like two to three inches worth around around the hive. It seems to be worth for some people. So uh, yep. if, yeah, well, I'm That's... always amazed that no one's actually. Uh, given that beekeepers are actively, there's a lot of people actively looking for insulation and trying to uh, warm their hives up. And yet the standard method tends to be going out and getting standard insulation and, and gaffer taping it onto the hive or securing it. And I'm amazed that no one's actually made a little blanket that's fitted for a standard 10 frame Langstroth that just drops over. Um, especially when you can get, uh, you can get barrel heating blankets for 44 gallon drums that keep the contents warm. You can get them for everything else, including your car, but no one's made one for the beehives yet. So if you've got any uh, people who fancy a, a new making a new company, uh, feel free to send one my way and I'll test it for you. <laughs> uh, last year, there was another discussion uh, which started out with uh, uh, condensation problems that people had in the hives. And someone noted that um, the with transpiration, you get humidity produced. If you have a great insulation on the top of the hive, that hot uh, moist air goes to the walls of the hive where the water condenses out and you get back that latent heat of condensation as mm -hmm. part of the equation, uh, as well as having the water drip down the side of the hive and hopefully uh, flow out somehow. Yeah. I mean, the actually, that was that was that was me. And let me cite <laughs> the uh, uh, Ed Clark is a guy who wrote a book, the copyright is 1917. It was Ed Clark and it's called Constructive Beekeeping. 
And it's a fascinating book. It's fairly thin, but he he basically presents the fact that uh, a beehive is a, or what we should be doing as beekeepers is to help the bees because what they're always trying to produce is the most effective moisture condenser so that they can condense the moisture out of honey. So mm -hmm. he's, um, his design was to have, um, basically the, the, he goes through all the scientific facts and it, it's pretty interesting, but essentially by having an insulated top, it does create that thermal convection. And with the sides being cooler, then the hot moist air goes up it's the warm spot and then the cool air goes out or the warm air goes out to the side, condenses on the side walls of the hive and the bees can either use it as distilled water or it will roll out of the hive. So mm -hmm. to reflect it, it works really well as, um, I mean, it's just, it, it's really a beautiful marriage of, of new technology with Ed Clark's really good concept. So with the Reflectix as the inner cover, it's a very light and easy, inexpensive thing to use. And then you don't have to have the, the multiple architectural additions of things for wood chips. And anyway, it's just a light and inexpensive and really effective um, top insulator. And it works yep. really well. So we track the moisture that, that drips down on the sides and it you can get it to where it's really even and it just does a fantastic job. And, and provides all the controls that the bees want. And that's why all the all the um, uh, screen bottom boards just they take away the controls that the bees have of controlling their environment, so they can't really really effectively condense their honey as they used to. So anyway, solid bottom board, insulated top with reflectix, and it works out beautifully. But it's Ed Clark, and it's a fascinating read. Constructive beekeeping. Okay, awesome. I've I've made a note of that. Because uh, that's very interesting. I mean, you're absolutely right with the ventilated bottom boards. We have a number of manufacturers doing the screened or ventilated bottom boards to actually try and reduce that humidity. And um, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that people people oversimplify how um, a beehive is constructed and what happens to the air within it. Um, is that they think there's just this warm mass in the center and the air rises up and then falls back down again. But uh, there's been some research papers where they show that the, the air flows within the hive are so incredibly complex and there's lots of little eddies that move things around because there's a huge role that, um, as, as you say, that kind of convection to the outside walls plays in actually removing carbon dioxide uh, during things like the winter clusters as well. And uh, it's really not that well explored in literature um, and in academic circles is how the whole thing works together. Um, especially, and as you were saying, that control of the water going down the outside, which doesn't always happen in things like the, the log hives. Um, but the log hives have got the additional thing of that they're actually coated in uh, propolis. Whereas the modern Langstroth can't build up a propolis layer because as part of our manufacturing processes, we sand everything smooth. Right. So um, that propolis in, within a natural log hive, and this is, uh, you know, Thomas Seeley did some work on this uh, many years ago. Um, that propolis coating actually acts as a water impermeable barrier so that uh, the condensation basically doesn't get chance to condense like that and it stays warm and humid. And interestingly, that's been linked by uh, some other researchers into a lower incidence of um, Varroa um, basically uh, reproduction ability is that the, the higher the humidity in the hive, the, the lower the instance of their uh, fertility. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of things in there that people are still kind of looking at, but there's a, there's a lot to be done, I think. And what is your take on, uh, on a slatted board on the bottom? Um, you know, just ah. adding a little bit more of that air space on the bottom. Um, Look, uh, in terms of basically having it exposed to the outside. No, it's a it's called the slatted board. You, you put it above a solid bottom board. And so it's a it's another you end up with another basically an inch and a half of space underneath the entire hive. A slatted uh, okay. board. So, so a bit more airflow. Well, the, yeah, but it's, yeah. It, it's, it's a board with with slats in it so that the, the bees can congregate in there. So you end up with basically a plenum underneath. Right, so yep. the bottom frames are not close to the bottom board. They're about an inch and a half off of the bottom board. 
Right. Okay. Um, look, I haven't seen those ones, um, but uh, look, personally, from playing with my research, I mean, I'll agree back to uh, what Hugh was saying, um, is that I, I do not agree with the, um, I don't agree with putting holes, ventilated holes in your lids, and I don't agree with ventilated bottom boards, because the bees know what they're doing uh, better than, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, the bees know what they're doing really well. Um, the only thing I change from basically a completely sealed hive is the entrance width. And I basically pull it back down for winter to about uh, this sort of wide. Um, and then in summer, I open it up to about this sort of wide. And the reason is, is that um, I believe with the fanning activities and the water importation and the heating, um, the bees will manage their uh, their internal environment better. Um, and I would have thought with something like the slatted bottom board, you've got uh, a greater airflow. Um, is that mainly for, it's mainly for these, airflow? Yes. Or? These, these go on top of the bottom board. So the entrance is a three quarter inch gap below the like the front end or one end of the slatted rack. And this is kind of a place for bees to hang out in. Oh, sorry. Um, so the entrance is underneath this. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. It's an additional um, um, piece of beekeeper equipment. Right. I have. I have. This is. This has not made it over to uh, this side of the pond, as it were. Um, look, I. Uh, I think that's. There could be. A, there could be a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> look, it's. We have such a. I mean, in Australia, from where we are, which is uh, tropical. Um, so a thousand kilometers above where I am, it's tropical. We're in subtropical. A thousand kilometers south, we're then in temperate. And then as soon as we go down to Tasmania, we're in a, an island just, just off Antarctica. Um, and all these have bees. And we all tend to use the same type of hives. Um, and there's a bit of an argument versus uh, ventilated tops and ventilated bottoms. And it goes back to that <laughs> Ask 10B question. Um, we can't. At some point, I do have a plan to actually set up like a beekeeping Mythbusters and test all the different types of lids and all the different types of bottoms and then say which ones actually build up fastest or not and then publish it uh, open access so we can actually go, look, that works better in this climate. But again, that would be great for where we are. And what we need to do is get people all over the place to do the same thing so we can actually determine it. But that's science for you. <laughs> a few years ago, I uh, went to a small manufacturer to buy some boxes. And I just happened to ask whether he had ever uh, had an order for um, three side sanded uh, wood boxes, um, namely that the inside surface would be unsanded. Yep. Uh, and he said he did have an order. And I went through the trouble of tracking down the beekeeper. And the beekeeper said, I think after a year or two, it didn't really seem to make any difference to him. Um, mm -hmm. So the, I think um, perhaps some more work needs to be uh, put into whether bees will propolize uh, the uh, rough sawn inside surface of a bee box if they're presented yep. with that. I think Marla Spivak's uh, whole push in that direction kind of was a bust. The same it kind was? of thing after a short time. Yeah, I think I, as far as I recall, it really didn't. They didn't pay attention after a while, and it never became something significant. Yep. I, I mean, save propolis one. scrapings and dissolve them in alcohol and paint them on the inside surfaces of beehives to give them oh, a wow. head start. <laughs> I'd be interested to see whether that um, that alcohol wash actually denatured the antibacterial antiviral propolis properties um, but it's interesting because I mean this comes back down to the design of beehives is that we've basically gone from uh, log hives um, and we're trying to take some of the features of log hives and put them into this rectangular wooden box and we like the propolis what we find in nature isn't always totally transferable um, so I think there's a, there's a really interesting thing. I mean, personally, I actually think one of the best hives that's available, um, and not for European um, honeybees, but for the Egyptian version, which is the Apis mellifera uh, lamaraki, I believe, um, which is the Egyptian uh, conical hives, which um, to give you an idea of how good they are, 
they've been in continuous use for about 5,000 years of beekeeping and they haven't really changed anything. So if you think Langstroth hasn't changed much, then the Egyptians really haven't changed much. But um, they basically uh, use these cylinders that are built into massive walls um, and their processes are much more like how they would find, have found the bees originally which is you let the bees build at the front near the entrance and then you just go in from the back and rob out the comb and the bees don't even realize you're there. But they have, um, they have all the things that we're trying to achieve in the modern hive, which is great insulation, um, great uh, thermal layering. So the bees don't actually realize that you've got in because all their combs are basically uh, perpendicular to the entrance. So you've got this really low airflow. So it's nice and warm and nothing changes. But um, if you're looking at, if you want to have a look at that, uh, Eva Crane has a wonderful book called The World History of uh, Beekeeping, or Beehives and Beekeeping, which is a, a tome, which is fantastic. And she tours the world and looks at all the different hives and all the practices. Um, that's slightly off topic, but... Well, that, that brings to mind uh, the Central or Eastern European uh, practice of having bee houses, which accommodate uh, dozens of hives. Uh, and you walk down the middle of the hive uh, house rather and open up a compartment, which is uh, the back end of a particular hive to work it. Yeah, well, that's the uh, AZ hives. Um, now, the, there's, a, there's an interesting thing here. I did, I did a talk recently on the, um, the uh, history of the beehive or alternatively called 4,500 years in 45 minutes of beekeeping. But the AZ hive, which is the vertical frames that you pull in and out um, within that bee house, was basically uh, from two guys. Uh, there's a Popovich and uh, another guy called Johannes uh, Zerzon, who actually discovered bee space about uh, oh, 10, 15 years before Langstroth. Um, and between Propokovic, um, Zerzon, and uh, another guy called uh, Francois Huber. Um, they basically did all the stuff necessary to get a really good working hive, which is kind of like those AZ hives. And then interestingly, um, Zerzon's book was taken across uh, to the US um, uh, by a guy called Wheeler and um, given to Langstroth to have a look at uh, prior to it being published, at which point Langstroth came up with um, his Langstroth hive within a year or two of, of this thing. They're all working on the same, same problems, but the, uh, the Europeans, um, uh, Propokovic and Zerzon, they were all basically called the, the fathers of modern apiculture in Europe, and they went ahead with the AZ hive, and then Langstroth was the father of modern beekeeping in the US. So he went ahead with the Langstroth hive. So you've got this interesting split in about 1840, 1850. Um, but they're actually great, those AZ hives, because you maintain the thermal stability of the hive as you pull in and out the frames. I'm just surprised we don't see more of them around. A little bit difficult, perhaps, to put on the back of a truck and haul to almonds. Uh, yes, although if you're driving around in large uh, trailer trucks anyway, um, you might be able to get the same density. I'm not sure. I don't know if anyone's explored it. You'd have to change people's mindsets too. That, that's done. the hard bit. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a question about materials. Um, I was recently um, awarded a, um, a free lot of insulation that came in with an industrial um, shipment. And mm -hmm. it is eight inch thick, metal both sides, and, and it's foam insulation. And yep. it, it, you think that's overkill? I, I mean, I, I, I love this idea about only treating the, the tops and not worrying about the sides as much and having a significant difference. Mm -hmm. And because it's metal both sides, it could be easily attached to the um, conventional, you know, conventional um, um, commercial um, tops. 
might be a little difficult to handle. Uh, the metal's sharp. You'd have to be careful. But I really like the energy savings. Do you think that's overkill, or would that? Um... Look, I think uh, eight inch eight inches of metal clad insulation is definitely overkill, but it would be amazing. Um, so it would work really well. And if, if you have the materials, um, then it's definitely worth experimenting with. Um, and look, the, the sharp sharp corners can be can be dealt with. Um, Indeed. But yeah, that. Uh, that level of insulation will make a, a vast difference, um, especially to things like, uh, especially during the winter um, and in the hot summer sun. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say go for it. it. Sounds great. You know, cutting that stuff um, requires um, a, a, a saw that takes two guys to use um, <laughs> of my age and, and, and a double cut and, you know, um, but the fact that it has metal on it and uh, on both sides means it's waterproof mm -hmm. and it also has the metal on top which is um, the natural color is white which is indeed reflective when you want it to be in the summer yep. and um, i've been just dying to i'd hate to let waste material go around and i have enough to keep the the, the b club in you know insulation so because it, it comes in it, it it came in on four foot by 11 foot sheets and that's why i used it for building material and i i i um i did about a 2000 square foot um, um storage building for my wine that i insulate with uh, a couple of um um fans um, 11 o'clock at night uh, and it keeps you know we have a very cool um uh, westerly breeze from the ocean um that's 55 degrees in most nights in the summer and i don't use ins i don't use uh, air conditioning to keep my wine cold so um it's been a it's been a bonus but i have a lot of extra well i mean it's it's almost like if you've got if you've got that much of it it might be um it might be faster to build a little shed to actually keep the hives in with the entrances, like Jerry was saying with the uh, the trailers, and that way you can keep more warm at once. You no, know, I thought about that. I did think about that, Dan. But the the working bees indoors, and you know, and with the Langstroth <laughs> thing, and um, you know, that can be quite exciting. Um, <laughs> and if you'd like to join in, you're more than invited. <laughs> I'll just watch from a nice safe distance. <laughs> now, I'll send you some photos and the medical report. <laughs> so, um, thank you for your time. What would you right, suggest? Thank you for your time. What yeah, thank you for your time on, tonight. What yeah, would no you suggest that the typical beekeeper in our area would use for a slab of insulation on the top of the hive five centimeters two inches uh look the um i'm just remembering i've got the uh so the calculations i ran on were just using um probably around uh 12 millimeters uh which is uh half an inch um of insulation will make a, a radical difference um if you, I'm not sure what your home, uh, your kind of Home Depot type place does, but I mean, I found lots of the hardware stores did um, two inch thick blocks or inch and a half thick blocks. And right. that's what I've used on the top of my hives um, because I've started taking, as an experiment, I made some flat lids and just glued on the insulation to see how high they'd actually build the brood nest inside the hive. And I found that they basically, you got less of the honey at the top um, on the brood frames because they'd build higher because it was nice and warm. Because normally in the brood nest, that sunrise pattern is because you have that insulation and that thermal mass of the honey. Whereas if you've got a warmer hive, you don't need as much. So uh, I've started actually converting my migratory lids to putting a piece of um, uh, thin masonite, which is like a, a kind of ply. Um, in the bottom and then insulation above that uh, compacted down so that I've basically got a B space um, above the frames 
and then just about this much uh, inch and a half of insulation in times of inside a migratory lid. Um, and I found that works really, really well. Um, and it's cheap and easy to do too. Thank you. So, all right. Okay. Any other questions? So you put uh, the foam above the inner cover. Yes. So um, I'm just saying, if I've got a whiteboard on here, I'll draw a picture. Um, so what I've found was the migratory lids, because they're about uh, this high, um, and you've got about this much space inside, I was getting a lot of um, comb building inside um, above the, the hive mat I was using. And that basically is a bit disruptive when you're going in for the inspections. So I put uh, wooden risers with inside, and then I've turned it from being a lid that's uh, this deep into being uh, a lid that's about this deep. So you basically have the lid, and then it has insulation, then it has another piece of board on the inside. Um, and it basically it's using it's using our standard commercial lids, but just insulating them, um, and that way you don't break the weatherproofing. Does that make sense? I don't know if I explained it very well. So we 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 use telescoping covers. Oh right? uh, yeah. So that's not what you're doing. The migratory lids, which are just like it's just like plywood with yeah. handles. Um. Yeah, we don't even have the handles. Um, hold on, I'll see if I can let's bring up a quick picture. Um, so let's go uh, beehive lid. Uh, here we go. It's the joys of the uh, joys of Google. Um, so this is our standard lid. Oh yeah. Um, with your your vents, which uh, all my bees block up immediately. Um, and this is the inside here. So what I'm doing is in these uh, in these corners, um, I'll actually put a wooden riser, just a little block of wood at each corner. I fill this space with insulation, and then I have a piece of um, uh, masonite, which is basically it's like plywood, but it's not made using a formaldehyde. So plywood contains a formaldehyde glue. So I try not to use that. Um, but I put a piece of board on the inside so it ends up being uh, just thick under the vents. Um, so you've got basically a solid inch of um, insulation sandwiched by two pieces of wood. And then you have the metal cover on the outside and that keeps it uh, really um, very weatherproof. Um, the and, then, we have... and then on top of that though, you're putting foam, yes? On uh, top no, no. of the metal? Nope, the foam just goes inside this space here. Okay, because um, I have foam on top of my metal to keep, but they're on they're on a roof, so they get lots of sun. So, yeah. okay, you, know, yeah. you might want to try with with the reflectus. Just lay it, lay the reflectus on the inside as he's doing with the foam, and uh, and staple it in there, and you know, as a uh, as an experiment too. I mean, one of the things I tend to uh, tell beekeepers when they're looking at modifying their de designs is go out and uh, buy a couple of those um, the fish tank thermometers, you know, the stick on fish tank thermometers, get some of those and pop them on the inside of the lids and leave them out in the sun um, and see what happens. Because the one that basically uh, registers the, the lowest temperature on a, on a hot day or a highest temperature on a cool day, that's the solution to go with. Um, and I highly encourage, have a bit of a prototype, have a play um, and stick your lid in the sun and whichever one gets the lowest temperature, that's the one to go with. So in, in our area, the, this kind of a cover is, is what we consider to be a migratory cover. Uh, so it just slides down over the top of the box. There's a three quarter inch piece of wood between the outside environment and the top of the box. Okay. Um, then on the far right here is what we consider to be a telescoping cover, which yep. is sort of a, a bathtub inverted, which uh, mm -hmm. sits down over an inner cover. So that's yep. the kind of the typical uh, setup that a, a probably an urban beekeeper would have would be a telescoping cover uh, plus an inner cover. And the migratory bee beekeepers 
Uh, the people who take their bees to almonds probably only use the um, the, tele the migratory covers. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the um, those migratory ones look. Uh, there's not really not much insulation there at all. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, ours, we have an interesting thing is that with those um, those lids I was showing you is that because the bees build all that comb up in there. Um, of their own construction, there's no there's no framing. They just build a, a, a complex of comb. Is you get really good insulation of thermal mass, and they'll actually build that up before they build the frames underneath. So if you put a fresh super on with one of those lids above the brew box, they'll build comb up in the roof first, and then go down onto the frames. They're building it as insulation. They. <sighs> Personally, I think there is a factor of that. Um, I think a lot of it is because that's where it's warmest. So you get the highest thermal gradient. So you get the best evaporation of the honey. Um, because I mean, I if I try and link need, this back to, sorry. I think, think they also need the extra heat because it's more efficient for making wax. They have to get pretty hot to make wax, don't they? Um, I don't know. That's not, hmm. not my area at the moment. Um, I know that uh, it requires a lot of energy. What is it? About seven kilos of, it's seven times uh, the weight of honey to make one of uh, wax. So one pound of wax is seven pounds of honey or something of that in terms of energy equivalency. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? This is very interesting to see the differences between the two uh, two sets of beekeeping methods. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Oh, a lot. Absolute, absolute pleasure. And if you come up with anything interesting, feel free to uh, shoot us a picture. <laughs> Thank you for uh, adjusting your time schedule to accommodate us. Oh, that's all good. It's lunchtime here. So uh, it's, a, it's a very civilized time of day to do a presentation. <laughs> Uh, one of our speakers was from Wales, and he he accommodated us by getting up at like three in the morning. <laughs> oh, crikey! <laughs> it was a very fun. good program, though. Lovely. Thanks, Dan. Very good. Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Yeah, thank you very much.